Hey, I get a lot of new viewers every time I do the year-end top 10, so, uh... Hi, new viewers. I'm Todd in the Shadows. I review music while sitting in profile and silhouette. Don't ask. It made sense when I started doing this a billion years ago. And hi, old viewers. Yes, I actually am trying to do these lists in an actual timely fashion for the first time and not, like, in the middle of next June. I'm still paranoid something's gonna come up in the last week of the year and I'm gonna miss it. You know who does it right? The Oscars. They don't announce the nominees until the year's been over for weeks, and they don't give out the awards until March. That's the way everyone should do it. But regardless, whether you're new or you're old, thank you for watching. Thank you so much. I do it all for you. I am certainly not doing it for myself. Because, man, do I not want to do this. Some years making the worst list is harder than others, but this year was the hardest of all. And not like in the past where there were too many or not enough bad songs to pick from. There were a reasonable quantity of bad songs. It's just that they weren't really that bad. That sounds like I'm being positive, but I'm not. It feels like everything was just there, not trying to provoke a reaction, just taking up space. Listening to this year's music, it is no surprise that the current cool drug of choice is Xanax. Xanax, of all goddamn things. How did we latch onto that? That's a drug for rich housewives and bad marriages. I mean, I get why everyone's on antidepressants these days, but it doesn't make for an interesting musical environment. I do this list about hit songs partly because it feels mean to beat up on flops that no one listened to. But a large percentage of this list's songs were both hits and flops. They had big splashy premieres and debuted high, lingered around for a couple weeks, and then plummeted hard enough to leave an extinction level crater. That's the list because they're the ones who bothered to try. It feels cruel, but it is what it is. We're counting down! Oh, I'm sorry. Was that a little too excited for 2018? Let me tone that down. <clears throat> We're counting down. The top 10 worst hit songs of 2018. Number 10. When my kids ask me what 2018 was like, I'll tell them Post Malone was really big. My epic on cycle, a bad like Michael, can't really trust nobody. I mean, that sums it up, right? That's your entire year. Or at least that's what it felt like. That said, it's kind of too easy to hate on Post Malone right now. He walks around in this visible pig pen cloud of filth. Looks like a Mad Max character who's too gross to hang out with the other characters. His music is so dreary and miserable. The most popular piece of music criticism this year was an article of just insult after insult at him. Jack Johnson with 808s. A rhinestone cowboy who looked like he crawled out of a primordial swamp of nacho cheese. But at some point you gotta let things be what they are. I don't get mad at country songs because they like Mama and Jesus. Sad white boys need music too. So, while I didn't like any of Malone's hits this year, the only one that I actively disliked was Psycho, because it promised so much. He's crazy! He's gonna go Psycho! And I'm like, whoa, man, my so goddamn cold. Diamonds when my teeth is Or he's gonna do the same moaning sad boy shit that he's always done. Like, I think Post Malone still thinks of himself as a rapper. I don't know why. Like, this is one of his songs where he gets to brag about his bling and bitches, and he still sounds like a lullaby written by Nickelback. The only thing psycho about him is that he sounds lobotomized. I think this is one of his only hits where he doesn't rap about his pillies and benzos and downers. At least that'd be an excuse. Does anyone know what he sounds like when he's off the drugs? TURN DOWN FOR WHAT?! And even if he did sound alive, his lyrics would still be for shit. His AP is his watch. My expensive watch is going psycho. I mean, it's uh, sitting there on my wrist, telling time, hands moving, psycho. 2018, the year of Post Malone. Thank you, next. Thank you. Number nine. I still see your shadows in my room. Can't take back the Right, the other big sad rap hit of the year. I kind of got the sense that Radio took on Juice World as the acceptable mainstream version of Ex Tentacion with no history of violence. But the trade off was a much harder to ignore lyrical subtext of misogyny, and I didn't appreciate it. That's why it's on the list. Which kind of feels like a dumb objection, right? If I was going to complain about misogyny in hip hop, I should have done it a long time ago. Rappers have been calling women bitches and hoes and tricks for decades. And a lot of those songs are all-time classics, and they're way worse than some whiny teenager, right? Uh, yeah, but there's a level on which all that stuff isn't real. 
Like most of these guys are happily married men. They're just selling a fantasy. They put on their gangsta costumes and rap about being badass player pimps and then they go home to their wives. But Juice World, like there's no macho play acting here. He is bearing his soul out there for you. There's something very raw and naked in what he throws down. That's the real him. He's keeping it real. And it turns out the real him is an ugly little shit with no talent. Give me lies. Who knew evil girls had the prettiest face? Like in terms of concrete evidence in the lyrics, there's not a lot there, but I just could not shake the vibe of crazy, vindictive stalker X from this kid. You found another one, but I am the better one. I won't let you forget me. The fuck is that? That's something someone says before they boil your pet rabbit. There are a lot of restraining orders in your future, kid. The one thing I gave Lucid Dreams credit for was the Sting sample, which I didn't even like, but at least seemed novel. And then I found out that I'm an ignorant moron because it's not original at all. Rappers have been using that beat since it was new, it's a super popular sample and I'm just an idiot. Oops. Sting said he liked this song for the record, but what he meant was that he likes money, seeing as he's suing Juice World for royalties. Seems like a mean thing to do to one of his disciples. I mean, Juice World is bringing Sting's lifestyle to a new medium. Tantric whining. He can whine for over nine hours. I won't let you forget me. Who are you again? Next. Thank you. Thanks, next. Number eight. Seems weird to say that a star as huge as Taylor Swift could have a sleeper hit, but Delicate was the surprise single of the year, slowly building and climbing the charts long after that album cycle should have been done with singles. And you know what? It was fine. Perfectly fine. In fact, I only had one real problem with it. They sing for the best. My reputation's never been worse so. I would pay Taylor Swift a lot of money to make sure she never sings about her reputation ever again. I mean, I relate, because my reputation has also never been worse. Seriously, I'm awful. But it's clear that Taylor's obsession with her reputation ruined her artistically. Or maybe I only think that because of Endgame, which hammers that word into meaninglessness in one of the worst hooks I've ever heard. Big reputation, big reputation. Oh, you and me, we got big reputations. I mean, I'll give it this, it wasn't Look What You Made Me Do. But as bad as that song was, I at least got the sense that Taylor liked it. She really thought she was doing something there. But all I hear on Endgame is a bunch of marketing geeks telling her what to do. Future is big, let's have Future on a song. Future and Taylor mix about as well as putting hot sauce on your toilet paper, but sure, why not? Honestly, he's a better collaborator than Ed Sheeran. When I was young, we connected when we were a little bit older. Ed Sheeran, as far as I can tell, is just the token dude in Taylor's Girl Squad. Which is fine, they both dated enough people. Although if they ever did date, we'd get some amazing breakup songs out of it. But this is not the first time they've collaborated, and they have never, ever had any chemistry. Like in this song, they can't even pretend. They're clearly not singing about each other. You wouldn't think they'd ever even been in the same room. Ed has nothing to do with the song, or with Taylor, and his willowy sensitive boy shtick kills the song's vibe. Essentially what Taylor's done is make her version of the hip-hop posse cut, where a bunch of superstars gather together to spit a few substandard bars and coast off their fame to another paycheck. But mostly it's just that awful word. Big reputation, big reputation, yeah. Taylor began the year still insisting that her Hell Beast Drama Factory reputation makes her fun and awesome, doesn't bother her at all. It rang hollow in January. But at the end of this year, when Ariana mined her own public drama and spun it into gold, reputation's failures just looked that much worse. Reputation, precedes me. reputation only did as well as it did because Taylor Swift held so much public fascination, and that's not a trick she can pull a second time. So this might legitimately be the end game for Taylor. I mean, good luck with your future career after this. Delicate indeed. Number seven. Look, I try to be objective, but let's be real. The more I have to hear a bad song, the worse it is. It's you, baby, and I'm a sucker for the way that you move, baby. Camila Cabello is a pretty bad artist. Fifth Harmony was also bad, but I kind of found them pleasantly nostalgic in how obnoxious they were. 
They were like the really annoying pop acts he'd have like 10 years earlier, and the duller pop music gets, the more I appreciate them. Every day is payday, swipe my card, then I do the name -name. Not by a lot, mind you, but you know, a little. For some reason, Camila Cabello is the one with the big solo career. I don't know why, since she is a sucking black void of charisma. She doesn't have a great voice, or a single distinguishing characteristic. All that said, I didn't really mind Havana, or have any thoughts about it, other than that the chorus sounds like it was written by the Minions. Havana, oh, nah, nah. In a louder and more annoying year, it might have escaped my notice. But after a thousand listens, to me, Never Be The Same became the representative for every no-vibe, soulless drone pop song I had to hear. Like this song never decided whether it wanted to be a big power ballad or a soft country-ish love song, and it kind of wound up as neither. Like imagine how hard a song like this would have gone in the 80s when you had real power ballads. Clearly the song Camilla's trying to make is Wrecking Ball. I, came in like a wrecking ball. I didn't like that song either, for a lot of the same reasons, but at least Miley had that sharp, keening voice that she could put some real power behind. Camilla's voice is so nondescript and powerless, it might as well be named Wiffle Ball. Of course, none of that is what got the song on the list. It was just this. I don't know if just playing the song really conveys what Camilla's falsetto sounds like to me after 10 months. I mean, the first time I heard it, it was annoying. The hundredth time. Camilla's breathy falsetto is the same sound my car made when it needed new brakes. And heroin was the worst two seconds of pop music 2018. I really hope things are never the same as this year again. Next. Number six. Rappers are like Hunger Games. One minute they're mocking Jay, next minute they get the stuff from me, goes so they copy Drake. I'm gonna be honest, I related a lot to Eminem's last album, which was largely about his complete confusion at the modern rap scene, which didn't make me feel great. Me nodding along to 46 year old arthritic Marshall Mathers and his befuddled shrug at SoundCloud rap. Like, yeah, this man has some good points. No, I don't wanna be that guy. Because at the very least, I understand why trap dominates right now. I mean, if the alternative is this. You forgot this happened, right? Yes, this was from this year. River debuted in the top 20 in the first week of 2018, then floundered in and out of the top 40 for about a month while goddamn 69 and the Greatest Showman soundtrack destroyed him on the charts. And rightly so. This song is so bad that I think it killed the pop crossover single in hip hop on its own. For one, it's another guest appearance by Ed Sheeran, which he was all over the charts at the time. I guess it makes sense. If you have absolutely no taste, Ed Sheeran's really popular, so he must be a great guest artist on rap songs. He's like the new Rihanna. He'll be like what T-Pain was in 2008. An Ed Sheeran rap hook is a guaranteed smash. I've never actually listened to music and I'm not clear what it is. I mentioned Rihanna because this song was clearly intended to be Love the Way You Lie Part 2, or Part 3, I guess. I didn't love that song. I thought the production was kind of draggy and wore out pretty quick, but it certainly got your attention. It cut deep, because Eminem was being honest about his own damage and fuck-ups. What the hell is this? Cause she loves danger, psychopath, and you don't fuck with no man's girl, even I know that. From what I can tell, it's about Eminem inserting himself into a love triangle. Now how am I supposed to tell this girl that we're through? That's not something that requires a big, sad Ed Sheeran chorus. Especially since Eminem doesn't seem to have any angst about it at all. Hi Suzanne, but I should have said bye Suzanne. He's not sorry, he's not angry. For him, the whole ordeal is mostly just a pain in the ass. He may as well be rapping about a roommate who doesn't do the dishes. You know how even in Love the Way You Lie, Eminem let one verse build and build, only to finish on a goddamn dad joke? Now you get to watch a leave out the window, guess that's why they call it window pane. Yeah, well River is basically that line, but it's the entire song actually just shit on my last chick and she has what my ex lacks. 
So she's been on the web lately, says maybe she'll be my Gwen Stacy. Despite a man, and I know she's Gwen using me to try to play him. I don't care. Hi, and then they both got eaten by a venom. Venom. God, what a weird year this man has had. Is it a new to use protection for a pit into your forbidden fruit? Use protection before you pit into your forbidden fruit. Good metaphor, Marshall. A plus. This song and that whole album was such a disaster, M was forced to release a completely different record just six months later. Critics were divided on it, but everyone agreed Ed Sheeran wasn't on it. A triumphant comeback! We're falling like the rain, so let the river run. Oh, this is so exciting. Who's gonna be number one? <laughs> well, tune in next time on Todd in the Shadows.